Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I am coming to you with my reading vlog for Dante's Inferno. Uh, I was debating on just doing one reading vlog for all of the Divine Comedy, but that seems like it would be an extremely long video and I am not interested in editing three hours of me crying about Dante. So we're about a week into April at this point and so a week into my Dante read-along. Uh, we are reading Inferno throughout the month of April uh, and so I am really excited about it and I've already really, really enjoyed what I've read so far. I'm already in Canto 5. I'm actually probably behind most people who are participating in the read-along at this point and that's fine. I can play catch up if I want to. I have really been enjoying annotating so far. That has been probably the most enjoyable aspect of this process to me is that I have just really, really enjoyed digging into the text and taking my time with it. And I thought that I probably wouldn't like a really long schedule with this, but I actually am really enjoying it. Uh, when I first read Dante, I read him in a course when I was in university and I had a course entirely dedicated to Dante and we read, um, the Divine Comedy and La Vida Nuova. And I always found that a really beneficial course. I thought it was really a lot of fun uh, to read Dante with a group of people and also to read it over an extended period of time because I do think that that allows it to sink in a little bit more. So I'm hoping that the experience with the read along is very similar. Like I said, I am in Canto 5 and so we are in the Circle of Lust. And Lust is actually my favorite circle, uh, so we're kind of getting my favorites out of the way early. Uh, there are definitely other instances in the Inferno that outweigh Lust, but I actually just really like all of the people that we get to see in Lust and in Limbo. I think you can tell a lot about the medieval mindset by who shows up where uh, in Dante's Inferno, and so I just really like to dig into this from all sides. I think it's a really beautiful work of poetry. I think it's a really spiritual work, um, but I also think it is a really good glimpse into the past. I mean, a lot of people think we can't time travel. You know, we don't have a time travel machine. We'll never know how people really were. We'll never get to meet, um, you know, such great historical figures that we want to meet. But I think things like Dante show you that you absolutely can time travel. And I feel like I very much get to have a conversation with Dante while reading this book. I feel like I get to know him very well personally. And so in Canto Five, we are meeting, you know, a lot of people who have been condemned for lust, a lot of the most famous lovers in history. So Paris and Helen, uh, Dido and Aeneas and Antony and Cleopatra. And Cleopatra is the only one that I have a real problem with. It's been really interesting to see the discussion that is happening in the Read Along Discord server, which I will link to down below, because a conversation did happen about the women who were in the Circle of Lust, uh, specifically Helen, Dido, and uh, Cleopatra. And a lot of people feel as though Helen is often a really passive character, and so it's interesting to slot her here. But I think Cleopatra is the really egregious one. And I've always really struggled with this. I don't think this is Dante personally at all. I think this is, again, the medieval mindset because I think it was very common knowledge at the time that this is how Cleopatra was perceived. Cleopatra was perceived um, as somebody who slept around, who was promiscuous. And yet it's not really true. We know of two men that Cleopatra was with and she was with them for a very, very long time in committed relationships. And so there is a lot of sexism that's folded into the medieval mindset, especially about women like Cleopatra, because Cleopatra was a very dynamic person. She was the leader of a country. She knew something like 13 languages. She was really, really intelligent. She was also apparently very beautiful. And I think this is a way to break her down. I think historically it has been a way to break her down. And so I don't blame Dante for his opinions on Cleopatra or for slotting Cleopatra here. I think she had to go somewhere. Uh, and so I think this was a really interesting area to put her and to put her with Antony. And from that, you also know that he really is going to blend myth and history together because Helen and Dido are here. Helen in Paris, Dido and Aeneas are in uh, the Christian afterlife. And in an earlier canto, that's how they essentially enter. Uh, Inferno is 
by Charon, uh, the ferry boatman who's really famous from Greek uh, mythology, who guards the underworld, who is essentially the ferryman who will take you into the underworld. And so there's a lot of overlap between Christian imagery and mythical imagery, specifically Greek. And that's really interesting because I've also been dipping in and out a bit of one of my favorite Dante biographies, which is by Barbara Reynolds. And she was talking about books that we know Dante read as a child. Uh, and so one of the books that he would have read was this book, a school book, that actually talked about the comparisons between Greek and Roman mythology and Christianity and what kind of overlap there was. Uh, and so from an early age, this is something that Dante clearly had to be thinking about and pondering. I will check in with you later and show you a couple of other Dante editions that I have that I'm planning on dipping in and out of and looking at their notes and comparing uh, with this. I really want to stick closely to the Mark Musa translation, but I also really would like to compare it to other translations. I do have a John Chiardi because I went to the used bookstore and was able to find a copy of that. And I also now have the Oxford World's Classic Edition, uh, which is by Sisson. Uh, and so I am really interested to see what the notes in that are because there are some absolutely incredible maps. So I will show those to you. I am just really excited about this read along and I'm hoping that everybody participating in it is having a really good time. Uh, but I will definitely check in with you later. So here are all of the editions of Dante that I am planning on reading during this read along. Uh, so I am mainly reading the Mark Musa. That's the one I'm tabbing as you might can see. Uh, so I am really enjoying that. This is still my preferred translation, but Svea had me convinced on this one. I will link to Svea's channel down below. She doesn't really, I think, like this translation. I think she thinks it's serviceable. Uh, and so far, that's the way that I feel. But the notes in this are so incredible. There are so many charts, um, so many kind of character maps. Like there are charts that will tell you who pops up where in each circle of the Inferno or Purgatorio or Paradiso. Uh, big names, big historical figures or mythological figures. And I think that can be really, really useful. There are also, of course, maps, but I really love the notes in this edition. And this is the John Chiardi uh, translation right here. And I love the size of it. It's just really wonderfully big and floppy. And I love this translation. He is trying to replicate Dante's rhyme scheme, I believe. And I actually think he's quite successful at it. Um, I really think the translation is beautiful, but I think the notes are a little bit lacking in this edition. Uh, I think this edition is pretty much the best of both worlds. This is my favorite translation of the three, but the notes are only middling. This is the most fantastic collection of notes on the Divine Comedy that I've read. I'm just obsessed with it. Almost half of it are notes, which I think is really, really wonderful. It's also just stunning. It's just stunning. I love the portrait of Dante here. So for instance, where I think the notes are a little bit lacking in the portable Dante. Uh, so I just read the canto that was a little bit about Florence and him kind of criticizing Florence. He talks to uh, somebody who is in Inferno who remembers Florence and wants to kind of get information from Dante. So they kind of have a conversation and the sinner who's in Inferno can actually see a little bit of the future. And he says, there are two noble men left in Florence. And you would think that the portable Dante would make note of that. I would tell you who those two notable men are, but it doesn't, it doesn't mention them at all. Now this edition does, and it says, we don't know for sure who they are. It could possibly refer to these couple of men. And so I think Mark Musa's thought process here is if we don't know it for sure, I'm not going to include it in a note. Whereas Sisson, who is the translator of uh, this divine comedy, must decide that that's valuable, that the notes are just as valuable as the text, which I think there is a complete reason for it, and I actually really agree with that. Uh, I really, really love reading the notes of Dante almost as much as the text itself. It's just a lot of fun. And I keep calling him Sisson, but I'm not quite sure he's French. Let me check. Evidently, he was from Bristol, so I can just call him Sisson, I guess. Sisson? If you know how to pronounce his name, please let me know. Charles Sisson. Uh, so I just really love this edition, first of all, because it's in the wonderful Oxford World's Classics, and they have largely become my favorite version of classics because aren't they just beautiful? And they're so floppy. They just stay open. Really lovely. I'm also, of course, adoring, adoring, adoring um, 
the Mark Musa translation, which I am annotating, having a lot of fun with. And this is the big John Giardi, which is huge, but I am enjoying digging through each of these. Just want you to know that Canto 5 is absolutely one of my favorites. And this is really, really one of my favorite instances. And I wrote that there, I guess you can see perhaps my favorite instance in Inferno after Ugolino, who I'm sure we will get to soon. Um, but this is the instance of Paolo and Francesca. Uh, and so this is just so beautifully written. My favorite part is our Galahad was that book and he who wrote it that day we read no further. There's a lot of Arthurian uh, elements to this part, but this is absolutely one of my favorite parts of the Inferno. I also love this. Love, quick to kindle and the gentle heart. Seized this one for the beauty of my body. Torn from me, how it happened still offends me. Love that excuses no one loved from loving. Seized me so strongly with delight in him that as you see, he never leaves my side. Love led us straight to sudden death together. Hyena waits the one who quenched our lives. These were the words that came from them to us. I think Paolo and Francesca are some of my favorite sinners in Inferno uh, because they are just really, really fascinating. Francesca is a really interesting character, um, and she is one of the few women that feels incredibly dynamic and well-rounded, uh, and that goes for me across the entirety of the Divine Comedy. I actually wrote a paper when I was in my Dante class on women in the Divine Comedy, and I focused in on her quite a bit. Her, Lapia, who is in Purgatory. Um, and of course Beatrice uh, who is in heaven. Lapia is really interesting. I'm excited for people to see her. She's one of my favorites. But I just really love all of kind of the devices that he uses in describing things about Francesca and crafting Francesca as a character because you notice in Canto 5 that Francesca never takes responsibility for anything. It is on everybody else that she and Paolo are kind of obsessed with each other, that they're kept away from each other, that they're lustful for each other. And I think what's really interesting about Paolo and Francesca in particular is that first of all, Paolo never speaks. Um, Paolo says nothing. Um, Francesca is the one who does all of the talking. But in some cases, as you move further in Inferno, you become less sympathetic to people. You start thinking, yep, you deserve to be here. When you learn what somebody has done, you feel like, yeah, this, this is where you need to be. Uh, and of course, that's by design because you're getting progressively worse in terms of sin the deeper into Inferno that you go. And so Francesca's is actually one of the least. But you almost don't feel sorry for Francesca and Paolo because you know they are together. It's done in such a way that you don't feel sorry for their circumstances, but that you actually are comforted by the fact that they are still together in the afterlife whether they are in hell or not, which makes this a really, really interesting portion of the Inferno. I think truly Canto 5 is potentially one of the most interesting. Uh, the Canto with uh, Ulysses or Odysseus is another that has been studied ad nauseum, uh, but I think these two are probably the most interesting in terms of scholarship and in terms of just being very thought-provoking. I just adore Francesca and Paolo, but I also want to talk about another of my favorite things about Dante, which is done to perfection here. And so he is a master of these lines, uh, but my favorite, favorite part of uh, the Francesca and Paolo section is when uh, she talks about the fact that they would read books together. They would read Arthurian romance together. Uh, and so that actually is what led to them starting their affair was they were reading this together one day and they view the book as kind of inspiring them to finally um, give in. And so she sums up everything by saying, we read no more that day. It's just amazing because so much is encompassed in that. We know, we know exactly what you did instead of reading. I think that Dante is a master of these lines because my favorite instance in Inferno uh, is with Ugolino. 
which is towards the very, very end of Inferno. Uh, and that is one where he also uses a line like this that can almost be interpreted two or three ways. And the line there is hunger proved more powerful than grief. Uh, and with Ugolino, uh, he was trapped in a tower with his two sons. Uh, and the sons died first, they starved them. And so he kind of ends his story by saying, well, then hunger proved more powerful than grief. And so I thought when I originally read that, okay, then he just gave into hunger and he died, you know. But um, actually, there was a rumor at the time that Ugolino ate his sons uh, to survive. And so there's like a double meaning there. Hunger proved more powerful than grief. You died of hunger or you became so hungry, grief no longer mattered to you, uh, which is really disturbing to think about. But I think Dante is a master of these kind of literary devices. And I think that is what makes Inferno so special. Inferno is the most studied of um, the Divine Comedy, and it is the most widely read. And when people want to read Dante, they really want to read Inferno and nothing else. And I think I largely understand why. Inferno is dirty and gross. And it's horrifying in many ways, but you also get a little bit of humor in it. You get people getting their comeuppance, which is really, really um, enjoyable from a reading aspect. Uh, and the rest of uh, the Divine Comedy is a little bit more philosophical in tone or a little bit more kind of harder to comprehend. I think you very easily visualize what's happening in Inferno, whereas in Paradiso, it's like beyond me sometimes what he's talking about. But I think that instances like Francesca and Paolo do make Inferno stand out above the rest. But I also wanted to talk about um, in Canto 10 about Epicureanism. Uh, which is really fascinating. There are a lot of people condemned to hell for Epicureanism in this canto. Uh, and so this, I think, is showing a lot of changing attitudes in the Middle Ages, especially for classical thinkers. A lot of people will call Dante the forefather to the Renaissance, and I've always had a problem with that because Inferno in particular feels supremely medieval to me. Uh, there is so much about um, the Divine Comedy in general that feels like it could only have been written in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so I think it does it a disservice to say that it's heralding in the Renaissance. But in some ways it definitely is because it's written in the vernacular. It's written in the language of the people and not in Latin, which is a really big thing that people push for in the Renaissance quite a bit. Uh, but I think this is an instance where you see shades of what the Renaissance is going to become uh, because Epicureanism was really, really um, kind of an interesting thought process from the classical period. Uh, and so I think this kind of shows how people's minds are changing, uh, how people are starting to interpret things because there's quite a bit of Inferno in particular where Dante you know, takes rumors that we now know are not true. And he uses them as fact because that's what he knows. And so many ways that to me seems supremely medieval in tone, but in so many ways, Inferno is so far ahead of everything else at the time because I just really kind of think of Inferno alongside Chaucer, uh, because I think Chaucer and Dante occupy a, a similar level of fame in their countries of origin, uh, because Chaucer is also really instrumental in the English language in a similar way that Dante is to Italian. Uh, and so I just really think about reading Chaucer and reading Dante. Dante feels so current. While parts of Dante feel archaic and utterly beautiful, other parts of Dante are so extremely modern. The moments of humor, the moments where he uh, condemns people he knows or people he doesn't like to certain rings in hell. And then in those certain circumstances, he'll like go off on a rant at them and be like, this is where you need to be. And in so many ways, that feels like something that could have been done yesterday. But Chaucer to me feels very much of his time. I think Dante has transcended the Middle Ages. I think Dante has transcended literature uh, because it does feel so current while still feeling classic. Chaucer only feels classic. Uh, and I think instances like this idea with Epicureanism and some of these other really interesting thought processes that he gets into, and I'm thinking 
this is more specifically shown in something like Paradiso when he gets into um, more religious philosophy. Um, a lot of that feels very nuanced and very new. It feels very Renaissance minded. Uh, so I do have to say that I do see shades of the Renaissance in Dante. It used to really irritate me because I think people often say this to say, well, Dante is better than the time period in which he was living. And so it kind of smacks of people saying they hate the Dark Ages or the Dark Ages were dark, which is a pet peeve of mine. It's something that really irritates me because a lot was going on in the medieval period uh, that was really progressive. Uh, and Dante is one of those things. So don't steal him away and say he's better than his time period. We have Petrarch to thank for that. Petrarch started that. But um, that's what I have for now. Uh, uh, so I will come back to you later. Another of my favorite quotes is in Canto 13. Uh, and this is the um, Florentine suicide who I think kind of goes nameless. And he says, O oh, souls who have just come in time to see this unjust mutilation that has separated me from all my leaves, gather them round the foot of this sad bush. I was from the city that took the Baptist in exchange for her first patron, who for this swears by his art she will have endless sorrow. And were it not that on the Arno's bridge some vestige of his image still remains, those citizens who built anew the city on the ashes that Attila left behind would have accomplished such a task in vain. I turned my home into my hanging place. There's a lot about this canto that I think is extremely interesting uh, because I like that the defense of the other guy, uh, is it Pierre, Pierre de la Vigne? Um, he has kind of constructed his defense like a law defense. It's very much in the style of Cicero. And I think this is another moment where Dante just shows off. Uh, I think that happens a lot in the Inferno. I think the Inferno is a really special piece of epic poetry uh, because so much of it is done in so many kind of different styles. And I think this is an instance that was really, really um, unique in terms of language and in terms of structure. I also really love the kind of random metaphors. He'll put in, you know, really random metaphors that take up multiple stanzas uh, that really do kind of describe things extremely well. Uh, and I really, really love his gift with metaphor as well. But this is another of my favorite cantos. Okay, welcome back to our last update uh, on reading Dante's Inferno. I kind of stopped updating uh, after a while because I thought it might just be more worthwhile to kind of put all of my thoughts together here at the end. And also because I have been procrastinating on my own read along. And so here it is, today is actually um, the last day of April. <laughs> so we are supposed to be finishing today. And I knew when I started it that I would leave everything to the end. Um, but I also really wanted to enjoy taking my time with it. So I think we made a good choice moving to the more monthly schedule reading Inferno across the entire month of April uh, because I do think Inferno is the easiest of the three to read and you'll have to tell me down below if you feel like that if you've read this before uh, but I do think Inferno is the most digestible so this is the one that people can probably read the fastest I think that things get denser as we go along with Paradiso being I mean potentially the most dense so I really do think um, we made a good choice here. But I thought I would tell you kind of how my reading has gone physically in terms of notes. Uh, so I have been annotating the Portable Dante, which was my goal all along and is the main translation that I've read. Uh, so there we go, there are all of my tabs. And we went off the rails a bit with tabs. I know I said in the beginning I wasn't quite sure whether or not I would stick with annotating everything, and I definitely did not. Uh, I definitely decided that only overt references to things that are um, like in mythology, uh, literary references or biblical moments uh, because there is so much biblical imagery in this that if that's what you wanted to tab you would be tabbing multiple things on each page and I think a similar case can be made for other literary references and mythological references so those tabs kind of took a back seat for me I rarely tabbed um other literary references so those are blue tabs and you may not even be able to see any 
when you look at it up close like this. Um, but something that I am glad that I tabbed uh, were references to people that Dante personally knew or instances that had personal significance to Dante. Uh, so even in cases where Dante doesn't necessarily know who the person is. If they were Florentine, I tabbed them as something personal to Dante because I figured it had something to do with the Guelph Ghibelline conflict. And that is something I kind of wish I had tabbed were references to the political climate in Florence and just in Italy in general at the time. Uh, because as we started this, I thought to myself there were less political references than I remembered there being. But as this has gone on and on, there have been so many more references to kind of the Guelph Ghibelline conflict. Uh, and so I do wish that maybe I had tabbed that uh, because that's clearly very important to Dante. And it is actually, to my memory anyway, more important in Inferno where he places his enemies. So I chose to read, really, Mark Muse's translation. I'm so glad I did. But I will say, I think they have pretty much gutted the notes for this edition in particular for the Portable Dante because I actually have the Mark Musa translation in the three individual um, editions of Dante that Penguin used to do back in the 70s and 80s. They might still do them in these updated black spines, but uh, I had the older editions of Penguins when I was in class, and I just remember the notes being far more extensive than they were in this. This didn't even have a note on every single page, uh, which I found very interesting because certainly there were instances that I believe needed to be noted, especially for a first time reader. So frequently what I did was open up the notes to the Oxford World's Classics Edition and have that open in front of me when I was reading the Mark Musa translation because there are a good hundred pages of notes you might can see. Uh, and I also think this edition is really valuable because there are a lot of charts and there are a lot of maps. And in total, I think the notes here were more valuable for the first time reader uh, because there are a lot of references in Dante that you get on a reread. Uh, but the first time through, I think you can be a little bit overwhelmed by things. Uh, so I would like to know down below if you joined in with this or if you just read Dante in general, um, which edition did you get and did you find that the notes were really extensive? Now these are in notes and had I been reading this straight through in this edition, I think that would have been very irritating to me to be consistently flipping to the back of the book to get information about what I am currently reading. But on the whole, I'm really glad I did this because the notes here were just so wonderful. They would tell you what was a reference to another literary work specifically. They would tell you specifically which verse of the Bible he was alluding to. You would often get a really long paragraph describing these more obscure historical figures, because I think people also struggle with that with Dante, that a lot of the people that you come across in Inferno specifically, uh, but more broadly in just the Divine Comedy as a whole, a lot of the people that you come across are people that were big names in Dante's day, but have little to no name recognition for us now. Uh, and they might if you are Italian. You might still know some of these people by name, but I imagine uh, even in Italy, a lot of these people have fallen into absolute obscurity. And so I do think those notes are really, really valuable. And I think those characters are kind of the most interesting to me. Uh, the Italians that he decides to place in certain circles of Inferno, I think are some of the most interesting characters. And I think it's really where Dante shows off. It's where Dante decides to sit down and school Florence and other towns in Italy. Florence is not the only one that gets criticized across the Divine Comedy. Siena also gets criticized, Pistoia, Pisa, Luca, I mean, all of these places just get scathed. I'm not quite sure where I left off with talking to you, uh, but I think the next thing that I really wanted to talk about that I made note of was in Canto 15. This is Brunetta Latini, uh, who is another of my favorites in Inferno, and I just, just really, really love uh, kind of the speech that he gives. It's really just utterly beautiful. Uh, so I'll read you a bit of it here. He said to me, follow your constellation and you cannot fail to reach your port of glory. Not if I saw clearly in the happy life. And if I had not died just when I did, I would have cheered you on in all your work, seeing how favorable heaven was to you. 
but that ungrateful and malignant race which descended from the Fiasole of old and still have rock and mountain in their blood will become for your good deeds your enemy and right they are among the bitter berries there's no fit place for the sweet fig to bloom they have always had the fame of being blind an envious race proud and avaricious you must not let their ways contaminate you your destiny reserves such honors for you both parties shall be hungry to devour you but the grass will not be growing where the goat is let the wild beasts of fiasole make fodder of each other and let them leave the plant untouched in which there lives again the holy seed of those remaining romans who survived there when this new nest of malice was constructed so there's a prophecy here that of course florence is getting a whole lot worse i think that's another of the really interesting aspects of the inferno and the divine comedy as a whole is the dead can see a bit into the future but they have no concept of what's going on right now and so we often get these really great prophecies because dante sets this in the year 1300 if i'm remembering rightly uh, and so when he's writing this it's long afterwards so he is able to write prophecies of things that he lived through but this is a really just great instance to me of him criticizing Florence. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of Florence throughout the Inferno uh, while Dante as the pilgrim, Dante as a character in the poem is still a little bit in love with Florence and is still kind of naive and doesn't really know what's coming but in a lot of these cases many of the shades actually prophesy the fact that Dante will be exiled in a couple of years. Uh, and so I just think there's a lot of real artistry here. There's a lot of real technical genius to the poem on top of it being really beautiful. I think a lot of thought went into each and every part of it. And this section with Brunetto Latini in Canto 15 is one of my favorites. But I think this is really beautiful. And I just love the way that certain characters talk, certain characters have a really unique way of speaking. Uh, and so I think Brunetta Latini is one of those uh, because I also really love on the next page when Dante answers him and he says, my mind is etched and now my heart is pierced with your kind image, loving and paternal. When living in the world, hour after hour, you taught me how man makes himself eternal. And while I live, my tongue shall always speak of my debt to you and of my gratitude. Uh, and so there's a lot of really interesting imagery around fame too in the Inferno because you notice that a lot of the time when Dante will go up to talk to somebody, he says, uh, tell me who you are so that I can make sure your name lives on. So I can make sure more years remember you, uh, which is really, really beautiful. Uh, but it does show kind of the fascination with fame because a lot of the shades too believe Dante is going to be remembered. There's a lot of conversation already that Dante's work is going to be talked about for centuries to come. Uh, and so the conversation around fame is really genuinely interesting. But uh, this actually is a reference to Latini's own writing. He had a lot of interesting conversation around immortality. Uh, and so I think that it was just a really interesting play on words. And I really do like the imagery around fame throughout the Inferno. I was going to skip it, but I just don't think I can, which is um, Canto 19, where he condemns a lot of the popes. Uh, I think that is just so great. And it's honestly probably the most famous instance in the Inferno. I think when people think of Inferno, they think of this. Um, they think of the Canto with Ulysses or Odysseus, uh, and they likely think of Francesca and Paolo. But straight up, this speech of Dante's is the best speech that Dante as a character in the poem gets. Uh, and I just really, really love this. So this is in Canto 19. And he's kind of had a conversation with one of the popes that are there. And he believes when he sees Dante that it's Boniface VIII coming to take his place. Uh, and at the time that this is set, Boniface is still the Pope, but he's absolutely terrible and Dante hates him. Uh, so he kind of corrects him and says, no, I'm not Boniface. And they have this whole conversation. And of course the Popes are kind of confined here due to simony, uh, which is kind of the selling of offices, charging for salvation, which is really uh, a deeply upsetting thing that goes back to biblical times and to the biblical period uh, with Simon Magus, who also makes his appearance. 
in this canto. Uh, and so Dante responds to this Pope. Well, tell me now, what was the sum of money that Holy Peter had to pay our Lord before he gave the keys into his keeping? Certainly he asked no more than follow me. Nor did Peter and the rest extort gold coins or silver from Matthias when he was picked to fill the place the evil one had lost. So stay stuck there, for you are rightly punished, and guard with care the money wrongly gained that made you stand courageous against Charles. And were it not for the reverence I have, for those highest of all keys that you once held, and the happy life, if this did not restrain me, I would use even harsher words than these, for your avarice brings grief upon the world, crushing the good, exalting the depraved. You shepherds it was the evangelist had in mind, when the vision came to him of her who sits upon the waters, playing whore with kings, the one who with seven heads was born, and from her ten horns managed to draw strength, so long as virtue was her bridegroom's joy. You have built yourselves a god of gold and silver. How do you differ from the idolater, except he worships one, you worship hundreds? O oh, Constantine, what evil did you sire, not by your conversion, but by the dower that the first wealthy father got from you? Often Dante is very sympathetic to the shades and to the sinners, and he feels really bad for them, and he feels like the punishment is extremely harsh. Sometimes he's basically moved to tears. But in this case, he really believes these men deserve this. And this is a really impassioned speech that I just absolutely love. I really really love it. Right here at the end with Constantine, he's talking about the donation of Constantine, which he never really thought was legally sound, but definitely Dante didn't doubt the authenticity of this. This is actually a fake. This is something that was created in the medieval period uh, and was crafted to look like it was written in the age of Constantine, that Constantine signed over so much to the church. And essentially, the church always used this to say, well, Constantine gave us the Western part of um, the Roman Empire. Uh, and Dante has always kind of doubted the legality of this, but uh, it actually actually was a fake. Dante would never have known that, but he's definitely angry about it here. A section two that I really thought I would skip, but I kind of feel like we need to talk about this, uh, is in Canto uh, 26, which is the Canto about Ulysses. I think his portrayal of Ulysses is really, really interesting because it's actually a very negative portrayal of Odysseus. Now, Odysseus is the Greek name for Ulysses and is probably the one most people use. And I often go back and forth between them, but I would typically say Odysseus. Um, but Dante created this entire story around um, Odysseus's last voyage and death. And it's not a very good portrait of Odysseus. It's a really, really interesting one because I hate Odysseus. I think this is really refreshing. Um, but kind of in the classical period, Odysseus is really revered for his intelligence and his cunning. Uh, and I think Dante definitely respects that. Intelligence is also a big theme. Uh, throughout the Divine Comedy, and you will find that he actually really um, respects people who were intelligent, even if they were in hell. He really respects certain people. Uh, but the reason that Ulysses is in this section of hell is because he uses his intelligence for the wrong reasons. Uh, he basically uses his intelligence and his kind of silver tongue to convince people to come with him on this folly and die. And actually in the medieval period more widely, um, conversation around Odysseus was really changing to kind of a darker theme uh, where he was really condemned for acting the way in which he did and using his cunning uh, in the way that he did. And so that's not necessarily unique to Dante, but what is is this entire story that he crafts around what happens with Ulysses and his crew in this final voyage. This is found uh, no earlier than Dante, though certainly later works make reference to this. But I just really really love Dante leaving his mark on mythology and on such a big giant of mythology at that as Odysseus. I just think it's really um, incredible. And for a lot of people, this canto stands above the rest. This is a favorite canto for a wide variety of people, um, especially because I guess Ulysses is such a famous figure in mythology. Uh, so this is one that people I think look forward to getting to. Uh, and I do think there's some artfulness to it, and I just really enjoy reading the critique of Ulysses, but it's not my favorite. Um, my favorite is actually 
Canto 33 with Count Ugolino. Count Ugolino is so special. This is really the moment for me that cemented Dante is an all-time favorite uh, and not just something that was good. It was when I read this section about Ugolino, uh, which is so, so gruesome and fascinating. A lot of the Inferno is really gruesome and, and gross and haunting in a way, uh, but I think this instance is really horrifying. A rumor at the time is that Ugolino ate his family members that were in uh, the tower with him, uh, and what I just love that Dante does is that he ends Ugolino's story with then hunger proved more powerful than grief. And I need to look it up in this Oxford. I need to see how Sasan uh, translates that because I'm pretty sure I'm going to be very, very harsh on it. I just love that line. Yeah, it's really clunky. When we had arrived at the fourth day, Gatto threw himself full length at my feet saying, Father, why do you not help us? Then he died. And as you see me now, I saw the three of them fall one by one between the fifth day and the sixth. Then I started, already blind, to grope over their bodies, calling them for two days after they were dead. And after that, grief was less strong than hunger. That feels really, that feels really clunky. Uh, because there's also, I think the part with Francesco and Paolo is really clunky as well in this edition, in the Sasan translation because she says, when we read how that smile so much desired was kissed by such a lover in the book, he who will never be divided from me kissed my mouth. He was trembling as he did so. The book, the writer played the part of Galahad. That day we got no further with our reading. And I just love, love, love that in the Mark Musa it says we read no more that day. Uh, I don't know. Some of this is just kind of, uh, being very nitpicky with translation, but I'll read you the Ugolino part uh, from the Mark Musa translation. The fourth day came and it was on that day, my Gatto fell prostrate before my feet crying, why don't you help me? Why my father? There he died, just as you see me here, I saw the other three fall one by one. As the fifth day and the sixth day passed, and I, by then gone blind, groped over their dead bodies. Though they were dead, two days I called their names then hunger proved more powerful than grief. It's haunting, it's just really haunting. Uh, you know, there's that thing going around, I think it's on TikTok that says, what is a line of uh, literature that lives rent-free in your brain? Then hunger proved more powerful than grief. That to me sums up every bit of Dante's genius. One line says so much, can be interpreted at least three different ways. Maybe Ugolino died. Uh, the hunger did prove more powerful than grief. Hunger took him to death. Uh, or maybe, maybe Ugolino was so hungry that he ate them, uh, which I think is a rumor at the time. I think that's why Dante is acknowledging it in this way. There's just such genius in it. And I think those two instances kind of show you why I prefer this translation to the Sasan. I would be interested to read the Sasan in full because I have heard good things about it, uh, but I just think that Mark Musa captures a little bit of the beauty. Truly, that's probably one of my favorite instances in literature, and I think it's the perfect note to end on. Uh, so now we will move into Purgatorio next month, uh, and hopefully you guys can join me and Tom from Tom LA Books uh, for our first live show on May 8th. We will be discussing Inferno uh, in more depth, so hopefully things that I missed here I can cover there. Uh, but I just, I want to end on the high note that is the poetic nature of the scene with Count Ugolino. It is just absolutely incredible. One of the heights of literature, in my opinion. I'm excited to get into Purgatorio because I would say, in fact, Purgatorio is my favorite of the three in whole. I think there are moments in Inferno that outshine others, but I think in total that I just really love Purgatorio the most. And I think Paradiso I like the least because it is so philosophical in nature. It's very abstract uh, in many ways. Uh, so I'm curious to see how people felt about Inferno, but I'm really curious to see how people will feel as we move further in the Divine Comedy. But please tell me your thoughts on Inferno down below. Tell me your favorite moments. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.